This episode is brought to you in part by Thomas Nelson, publisher of Life is Hard, God is Good, Let's Dance. Written and narrated by Brant Hansen and available everywhere you get your audiobooks now. I had one woman, her name is Soha, that when James died, uh, she called me and she said, Hey, Chrissy, I want to, every Sunday at 7 o'clock, I want to just pray for you. I just want to call you and, and pray for you. And I, I pretty much said no. And she called back and she goes, okay, how about I call you and you just answer the phone? You don't have to, you don't have to pray. You don't have to say anything. I just, I, you know, you don't have to participate. I just need you to pick up the phone. And I would say about the good first eight months to a year, I picked up the phone. I listened. So how would pray? And I would say, talk to you later. And I'd hang up. This is Where You're From, an origin story podcast at the intersection of faith and culture that digs into the influences and experiences that shape who we are today. Join us as we gain insight into the Bible's wisdom for all, regardless of where we're from. Hey, y'all, this is Rasul Berry. Thanks for joining me on Where You're From. This week, I want to share my conversation with Chrysinthia Floyd. Chrysinthia is the vice president of Our Daily Bread Publishing, with over 20 years of expertise at publishers like Simon & Schuster, HarperCollins, and David C. Cook. As you will hear later in the episode, Chrysinthia is also a classically trained singer who has traveled the world and has performed for such dignitaries as Bishop Desmond Tutu and President George Bush. You can find out more about Chrysinthia by clicking the links in the show notes or by visiting whereyourefrom.org. That's where, Y-A, from, dot O-R-G. Please join me as I ask Chrysinthia Floyd, where you're from. I am from a place called Gastonia, North Carolina, mm. about 10 miles south of Charlotte, North Carolina. Okay. It's uh, somewhat of a, a bedroom community. Mm. I am the youngest of three children, and there's 10 years between my sister and I and then eight years between my brother and I. Mm. So I was undoubtedly, uh, you know, a surprise <laughs> to, to my parents, a blessed surprise to my yeah. parents. And on my mother's side, I'm one of like 35 grandchildren. Wow. And I'm actually in the 30s. So <laughs> by the time my grandparents saw me, they had seen plenty more. <laughs> They'd seen others, and so I was, I was kind of nothing special <laughs> by the time I arrived. <laughs> <They're> like, <laughs> but but you're everything special, and that's oh, why okay. you're here too. <laughs> Thank you. So when it comes to like, just give us a picture, like when you talk about Gastonia. You know, North Carolina is that state that has all these little towns and little mm-hmm. cities that are scattered throughout. What was it like growing up there? Yeah, small, especially my community, small, tight knit, where you're really entrenched with family, my mother's family specifically. Specifically, because she had five sisters. She's she's from a family of 14, mm. six women, eight men, and she's actually the last living sister in this family. Mm. And so it's a textile town full of plants and manufacturing, trucks like f- from Freightliner, thread from a place called Threads, cotton, furniture. So huge in manufacturing, mm. huge when I was growing up. Okay. In, in fact, my mom worked in one of these factories for probably collectively for about 20 years. Mm. Yeah. So it sounds like you describe a tight knit family, but also you, you mentioned your mom and your grandma with some very strong women in mm-hmm. your family. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Tell us about that and the <laughs> impact that that had on you. Well, I mean, to some extent, it was uh, a kind of a, a double edged sword. You've got really strong, opinionated women, but also a family, specifically her side, who really had preference and deference to the men. 
in the family. It was th- just that type of era, and it was sort of carried through with my mother, even in the raising of us. Uh, so uh, my, I will, and my brother knows this. My brother is the favorite, <laughs> hmm. but there was certainly a pecking order, and my sister and I were not at the top. <laughs> my brother was, even though he was the middle child. He's the middle child. But I will say about the women, exceptional women in hmm in my family, and I would say both my mother and my father's family, but I had the greatest influence from my mother's family because while a number of them had not been college educated, they were entrepreneurs. I mean, I think about my mom's oldest sister, Virginia, along with her husband, ran one of the uh, Black-owned general stores in town, still a store where she would go outside and pump the gas for those that <laughs> so wow. for those that came through and it was always a treat for us to visit that store because of course we get tons of candy and then i think about my aunt ella uh, my mother's youngest sister who also had a hair salon but worked just like my mom in manufacturing mm. for years and then later cared for her daughter who had MS. And unfortunately, we lost my cousin at the Mm. young age of 35 years old. But my aunt had cared for her until her passing. Then she had to then turn around and start caring for herself because she became ill and she died relatively young as well. And then I think about my Aunt Dorothy Washington out of Baltimore had almost a 40-year career at the FBI. Wow. Every day commute from Baltimore to D.C. to work. Mm. And that was pretty amazing for our family to know that we had a relative that actually worked at the FBI. (laughs) Especially for that time. Um, That seems mm -hmm. like a pretty advanced thing. Yeah, yeah. And then I also think about, I have another Aunt Dorothy. She is an aunt by marriage, but an aunt nonetheless. And she is currently a curator and founder of uh, the Gaston County African American Museum. Mm. She's the reason, one of the reasons why I ended up in sort of this this publishing business, because she instilled this love of books in my life. But then I also think about my cousins. Now, I told you, I'm like, I got almost, <laughs> I'm one of 30-something. So when you have that many cousins, there's a large age range. And yeah. so I was entrenched with with cousins 10, 15, 18 years older than myself. And there's a lot, a ton I learned from them, specifically around work ethic. Mm. You know, I'm just going to call some names because it's a way for me to honor them. I think about my cousin Anne, Ruby, Roxy, Jeanette, and Shirley. I think about those those women who really were great examples of just mm. work ethic and just how to live life. I mean, these and these women are still very much a part of my life, even though I may not see them as often, mm. but there's often communication uh, through the group text with okay. those ladies. Yeah. Gotcha. So y'all roll deep. So like growing up in school, you had your cousins there, you have, mm. which also meant you also had some built in protection, probably like people didn't mess with you just because they were like, well, I would say protection <laughs> didn't so much pertain to me because I was one of the younger cousins. Remember, oh, I, so. I kind of was by myself by the time got it. I got school age. Mm. I mean, I was probably around nine mm. and alone at home. Because right. my brother and sister had already left for college. Gotcha. So what was your relationship like with your parents growing up and what were they involved in? What did they do? Yeah. So, you know, our faith was really, quite frankly, instilled mm. in us through my mom and her side of the family. My father wasn't, he was a believer, but not a church going man, per se, mm. but certainly a believer and was more church going toward the end of his life, but still believed in God and had faith. So, you know, things did revolve around our faith and our church. Mm. My parents, they had lots and lots of um, hurdles to overcome, I think. You know, Mm. my dad was a, a chef, but he also at one time worked in one of the, the manufacturing companies as well, the Christmas ornament factory. <laughs> but somewhere along in their marriage, it became clear that my mother suffered from mental illness. And that really, as I understand it and, and what I can recall, weighed heavily on their marriage and then even my childhood. Mm. Because while we think 
in you know hindsight's 2020 while we think some of those problems were probably in existence before it was diagnosed mm-hmm. and so there are a ton of difficulties with just life once it became clear that she wasn't healthy. So, you know, I would say this was discovered about the time I was eight years old. And I recall just my dad at some point having to communicate to me that my mom had been hospitalized or committed. And I didn't quite understand what that meant. But what I knew for sure was that it was really devastating for him because as he told me, he was crying. Mm. He was, you know, he had me on his lap and he was crying. And so... And was that unusual for him? mm -hmm, It was extremely unusual, very Mm. unusual. And so I think that, you know, when I think about how they interacted with one another from my perception Mm -hmm. and what I remember, that's the thing and that's the biggest rock that I remember the most. My sister and brother will have different memories, you know, because they they were gone by the time my mom was diagnosed. And so that, what we're about to experience with her illness just really frankly changed the landscape of our life. Mm. And I would say for years to come. What was some of the ways in which you experienced that change at first? Yeah, I mean, the shift was really strong for me, mainly because my dad is working a lot. There was no longer a second income in the home. So there was extra work he was taking on and doing, you know, maybe two jobs. And so it meant that I was alone a lot. And it also meant that my role as as a child really shifted to more of a caretaker role. When I became legal, I became my mother's legal guardian Mm. and a guardianship I hold to this day. But the shift from sort of this innocence and childhood really occurred during this time period. Mm. Because I say to people, it's hard to explain, even from a child's perspective, what you witness during those episodic moments of someone's mental health, lack of mental health. Some people wouldn't believe it, but it is frightening. Mm. Your world seems like it's turned upside down. Mm. And I'm, you know, I'm kind of reverting back to being that eight-year-old, nine-year-old kid who's witnessing her mom sort of doing interesting things. And, you know, others may have called it quirky, But surely now we understand that there was something more to it. So it sounds like, you know, she was hospitalized, but she would maybe go back and forth Mm -hmm. between those type of more structured environments and home. That is that is absolutely correct. Yeah. And, you know, we're not sure, but we we think there was some severe trauma in her life. We're not quite sure what that was. It was interesting. There was always a time period in the season or the year where things would sort of creep in and and there would be a shift in her personality. And I could always say, "Mm, February's here. What something You know, I'd start to look for it, which was not always healthy for me. But nine times out of 10, it would show up. Wow. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think that the reality of being at home alone, did that maybe create even more of a yearning of departing to another world that books can sometimes afford for us? Exactly. You know, I've said to people, I really feel that literature books saved my life. And I think my, my aunt knew that. I think she knew that I needed this type of comfort, uh, this outlet, for sure, Mm. because I I really became a voracious reader during that time and for years on, for sure. What what was one of the first books that really captured your attention and your imagination? (laughs) Oh, my goodness. I read all the blubber, super blubber books by Judy (laughs) Plume. (laughs) Those were some. Uh And then read a lot of Mildred Taylor's uh, Roll of Thunder, Him I Cry. Mm -hmm. And oh, my goodness, there were just so many. Hmm. There were so many books that that I really enjoyed as a kid. Hmm. So you've said before, I have a heart for learning and a heart for always wanting to do better. My parents instilled in us a work ethic that I believe at times as Floyd kids, we have taken even (laughs) too far. (laughs) Tell us a little bit about that work ethic that you had instilled in you. 
Yeah, well, you know, it was made clear. You graduate, you're out. You're gone. Don't even think about coming back. So you got to figure it out. And so that also meant working hard and and really having a plan after you graduated from high school. I mean, it was very, very clear. And, you know, we all work probably, I think, with the exception of my brother. My sister and I worked in manufacturing for several summers. And it was my dad's way of saying to us, you know, this is great work. And it's provided for your family. But I do think he was like, I I want something different for each of you. But that means that you need to understand what it's like to work in these places. And each time I was driving home or or going home or my dad picked me up, I was like, yeah, no, not so much. Not doing this. This is not what I'm going to do. I got to figure this out. But that was the point. And so my sister left in 1976 for Howard University. She went on to a career herself at the FBI as well, like my aunt. And then in law, she got a degree from Howard Law as well. And she Mm. worked uh, in litigation for a number of years. And then my brother, very, you know, very strong work ethic for his own talent of being an incredible sports individual. You know, he he excelled at all sports, Mm. but then started to concentrate on basketball and then going on. But it sounds like, I mean, with you having these older siblings, older cousins, very strong voices, in one sense, it was a beautifully supportive community. Mm -hmm. But I also know as being the baby and my I was the youngest in my family, that it can also be tough to find yourself. And to find your own voice. Tell us about that struggle and how you ended up literally finding your voice. Yeah. The biggest shoes I I tried to fill were my brothers, right? So when you've got a brother who is just the apple of your mother's eye, as well as the the community, you can get pretty lost. He is all time leading scorer of Georgetown, assist leader and steals leader still to this day. Mm. You know, he graduated in nineteen eighty two and that's when he went to the pros. But when you are sort of in that that shadow mm. of someone, and, and let me tell you, you know, he's he's one of the best brothers that a person could have, first mm. of all. And only only one of the best for me. And in fact, I owe a lot to him because of what he instilled in me as well. But once they were gone, I had to really try and figure out, you know, what was special about me, right? What was special. Mm. And it wasn't until I think junior high, when my mother, my mother, I think forced, forced the teacher to remove me from PE because she thought I was going to, you know, have an asthma attack and die. And I was placed into chorus. And while in chorus, the teacher discovered I had a voice. I had no idea I had a singing voice. And so she discovered that I have this really mature at my age singing voice. And I didn't quite understand it. But what I saw from her was she was engaging me after school. She was placing me in choral festivals. She was an encouragement. She was always talking to me about private lessons. And I'm thinking, what is she hearing? Like, I had never truly really heard my voice. I didn't think anything special about it. And I recall being at a choral festival and and standing by the piano. And one of my sister's friends, Jacqueline, she said, hey, Chrissy, what are you doing here? I said, well, I'm, I'm here because I was put into this festival. And she goes, well, you're about a year too young for this. And I said, well, I'm here. And we started to sing. And then she heard me sing. She goes, oh, I get it. <laughs> she goes, I get why you're here. I get why you're here. So I started to understand it. I mean, it took, it probably took about a good year for me to really grasp mm. the, the specialness around my voice. Uh, a 12, 13 year old kid who who had such a mature, mm. even close to operatic sound. Mm. It's just kind of unheard of. And so I started training vocally when I was 14. Wow. Yeah. And then so when there is that decision, because you like the parents are like, yep, y'all got to get up out of here when you're done. So what did you decide to do when you graduated high school? Yeah. I mean, I had vocal scholarships. Mm. And so I elected to pursue music 
And I did so at the University of North Carolina at Greensboro. And then after graduating, I I got a a music ed degree because, you know, that was the safer bet (laughs) (laughs) to go education than performance. But then I eventually ended up in New York at the American Musical and Dramatic Academy for Mm. further training Mm. in musical theater and opera. And that's how I ended up in New York for as long as I was in New York. So I did, you know, I really started to settle into, Hmm. you know, music and just being able to use my voice. But what the discovery of the voice did for me was really increase my confidence. Hmm. I had been a child, especially once my brother and sister left, I'd been someone who had been bullied um, quite a bit in the neighborhood. And so finding music became like another, you know, another lifesaver for me. Mm. What do you remember about caring for your mom and having this big responsibility at such a young age? But then there's this new thing that you've discovered and found passion in in life. How did you navigate that? Like, and what happened with the caretaking responsibilities once you, you know, were now in college and and moving on in New York? Yeah, I mean, the caretaking responsibilities were often done from a distance and Mm. often done by getting on planes a lot of times and that, you know, having financial support from my brother to do so, right, Uh, Okay. to be able to to make those trips back and forth from New York to, to North Carolina. Now, my father at that point was still alive, but it was tough for my mother and my father, especially for my mother to accept any help at that point Mm. from my dad. It was really tough for her. And so there became a dependence on me for a lot of Mm. things. And in fact, my dad would call me and say, I can't convince your mom to do this. I remember my mom took a fall and she broke her ankle. Mm. And he called and he said, you know, she's fallen. She, I can't get her to the doctor. And I know she's in a lot of pain, but she keeps pushing it off. And he says, and I can, you know, her ankle's huge. And so I got on a plane and walked into the house and said, hey, we're going to the doctor. Wow. And I got her in the car, you know. <laughs> yeah. mm. And so I think there's been a trust that I've built with my mom over the years because of when I was there by her side As a child, when she first became ill, that there's just this sort of trust she has that I will always do Mm. what's right for her and Mm -hmm. certainly do the best for her. I mean, that's in one sense, that's beautiful to have that type of trust in that intimacy or relationship. But in another sense, that's hard Mm -hmm. to have that weight and that responsibility as a daughter. I mean, for your father to be coming in and being like, hey, help, you know, like, was that was that tough for you? That that was tough, but I also found it to be easier Mm. because their relationship became very contentious. And I just Mm. think that to minimize any of that, that it required some intervention on my part. Wow. So you're in New York and what kind of gigs or performance are you doing? So what I often did were summer gigs. I actually was part of a a group that was a part of the Methodist church that required me to go back to the mountains of North Carolina every summer as part of their music staff. And what we would do often was we would provide music for all the church, the Methodist church groups coming in for summer conferences. And, you know, we'd sing for their devotional hour. We'd sing for their lunch hour. We'd sing for their evening service. We'd sing family weekend service or special programming. And I actually did that for 10 summers. And I did it so long because it allowed me to leave New York for the summer and also allowed me to be only two and a half hours away from my parents. Mm. And toward the end of my stint as one of those singers and music staff, my father had been diagnosed with leukemia. Mm. And so it allowed me to be close to him during the latter part of his life. Mm. Gotcha. So in this moment, are you imagining like that music? Obviously, you, you're you formally trained. You're finding opportunities. Like, were you thinking this is going to be kind of the main stay of my career? And if so, then what changed that? Yeah. Around the time my dad died, I actually lost 
a passion for singing. Mm -hmm. My dad had been so integral in the support of my musical education. There was not a place he wouldn't drive to hear me Mm -hmm. sing. You Mm -hmm. know, you hear about the parents that get on the road to see their kids play sports. He got on the road constantly to hear me sing. And so, you know, my biggest, biggest, biggest fan was my dad. You know, I really just kind of lost that spark once I lost my biggest fan. Mm. And so during that time, I, I just decided not to pursue it or just I thought I was taking a break. Quite frankly, honestly, I stopped accepting calls from my agent. I had an agent. Mm-hmm. I stopped accepting calls from my agent because I didn't want to audition anymore. I didn't want to do anything. So I settled into this part-time job I'd had at a bookstore. Hmm. And that's how my publishing career started. Uh, so it's interesting. So it's like once again, in the similar way in which your mother's illness kind of leads you to this world of books and the kind of peace. And it's like your your settled place it seems like that comes back to you and and the loss of your father and then mm-hmm. this opportunity to try to figure out what's next for me. You find it in books again. I did. In fact, when I it, it's so strange that you, that you say that because when I thought, OK, go get another job. Your dad's gone. Let's go just get a part time job. You can if you want, mm-hmm. you can keep pursuing music. But I was really looking for kind of an exit ramp just for a short time. And I lived on the Upper East Side of Manhattan, and there was a Barnes & Noble there. So I went to apply at the Barnes & Noble, and I got a job. Wow. Yeah. Once you're there, what do people discover? It's almost like you get discovered again, but this time for leadership abilities. Yeah. So when they found out that I'd had at least – this particular manager of this Barnes and Noble store, she happened to manage two stores on the same street. So at Lexington, there was just a freestanding Barnes and Noble store. But on 86, there was a Barnes and Noble Junior, which was a freestanding children's bookstore. Mm-hmm. So they stick me in like this world of children's books and I'm in just in heaven. <laughs> and it was such a fun job. And they discovered I could sell very well. I could sell books extremely well. And I was pretty organized. And so, you know, actually within a year, I was asked to help manage the store. And then some folks came into our store from the corporate office. And then after they left, the vice president of merchandising from Barnes & Noble Corporate called my boss and said, hey, we'd like to interview Chris Cynthia for a buyer role. So I eventually moved into the corporate office as a national book buyer for Barnes & Noble for the entire country. I was on the retail side of publishing, but Mm. that was kind of the leap. Okay. So once you make that leap, obviously that's a significant move, right? Yeah. It's huge. It's huge. Yeah. Yeah. At this point, are you now thinking, okay, where can this go? And if so, what's the next step that you take to get there? When we come back, Crescentia will share how she found herself speechless, sitting next to one of the most famous English singers and actresses of all time. That's coming next on Where You're From. This episode is brought to you in part by The Good Book Company, publisher of More to the Story by Jennifer M. Kwame, a book for teens grappling with questions of identity and sexuality. Go to thegoodbook.com slash more to the story to receive 25% off with code STORY. Hey, y'all. Before we get back to my conversation with Crescentia Floyd, I wanted to share a quick teaser from our next episode with Dr. Russell Moore. This is where you're from. When I say my wife is really chill and up for anything, she is, and that's why it made such a difference to me when she said, you know what, you can do what you want, but if you're still in the same denomination by summer, you'll be in an interfaith marriage. And because she doesn't give any ultimatums <laughs> in any other time, I was like, whoa, this is really serious. Now let's get back to our conversation with Crescentia Floyd on where you're from. Well, I don't think I was thinking about 
the next step per se. I just okay. wanted to enjoy that role and what it meant and being around the books and and making new contacts and creating new relationships like I was doing, meeting some of my favorite authors. You know, I had tea with Julie Andrews. What? Yes, I had tea with Julie Andrews. Uh, now, uh, how was, did she write a book or something for kids? She, yeah, she wrote a book for kids. And at the table, there were two other folks at the table. I could not speak a word because, you know, it's not, I'm not thinking of her as an author. I'm thinking of her as like Sound of Music and Mary Poppins and all of those. And so we are shoulder to shoulder. Uh. And I say nothing because I am I am absolutely just mortified of the fact that I'm sitting beside one of my heroes, right? I'm wow. sitting beside the Julie Andrews and I can't say a thing. And I bet you could hit them high notes from the Sound <laughs> I of could. Music too. I certainly could back then. <laughs> I can't now, but I certainly could back then. And she got up and she went to go chat with another table mm. and someone sat down and said, so how was it? How how was the conversation? And I actually started to cry and I go, I couldn't say a word. I was so upset. I mean, I was embarrassed. I said I was too mm. nervous us. And apparently this person that I had mentioned this to whispered something to Julie Andrews as she was heading back to her chair. And Julie Andrews turns around and says, why, Chrysanthia, what a lovely dress you're wearing. And she comes back and she talks to me. And then we start talking about the voice and we start talking about music teachers and we start, you know, she just starts to open up about um, singing and things like that. So it was like a magical 15 minutes of, you know, mm. I, I had spent almost 30 not able to say anything. But then there was this point in which she looked me dead in the eye and just had this conversation with me. Wow. And probably about three weeks later, we were at a manager's meeting. And she was the keynote. And I walked backstage and she goes, why, hi, Chris Cynthia. And I turned around like, oh, my goodness, she remembered my name. You know, know, (laughs) hearing that she's as delightful in real life as she is in The Princess Diaries (laughs) and Mary Poppins is a few of my favorite things. (laughs) Right. Oh, very good. Very good. Thank you. I thought you'd get that. That's a good one. That's a good one. (laughs) Wow, that's that is special. It also shows the value of listening to people and engaging. And the fact she didn't have to do that, circle back around. Oh, she did not. But again, once you had that new opportunity, you did find your voice again. And so at some point, like which happens first? Do you decide to go back into education first or do you decide to go take a deeper dive into publishing first? Yeah, I mean, I I worked for the company probably upwards of about eight or nine years, and the longest role was in that buyer role. But because of my connection with my hometown and my aunt as a librarian, and then just my home church, I wanted to do something that I felt like would really impact my community. And mm-hmm. so this is strange. I mean, God, I uh, let me tell you, God's opened doors for me, but then God has closed doors where he said, no, go down this path. And this was one occasion where the door was flung open. And when I had this sense that I wanted to do more than just, you know, sit in my office and buy books and place them in stores, I went online to look for organizations that I felt could utilize my talents. And I was thinking nonprofit. So I went looking and all of them required a certain type of experience that either needed some lobbying experience, especially if they were, you know, in D.C., or program director experience, which I didn't have. So I put it to the side. And about two months later, I get an email from my boss who says, the chairman of Barnes & Noble wants me to fly to the Alex Haley Farm in Tennessee for a roundtable discussion around children's literature for African-American children. Mm. And what I didn't know was that this particular farm, the Alex Haley Farm, is owned by the Children's Defense Fund. 
And um, okay, for those who may not be familiar with the name Alex Haley and Children's Defense Fund, let's just catch this up. Why are those names significant? I know you were about to go there with. Yeah. Well, so we know Alex Haley is uh, author of Roots and an incredible author mm -hmm. and statesman. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then the Children's Defense Fund um, for any major children's legislation that you have on the books now was probably placed there from the work done by the Children's Defense Fund. And um, when you think about Head Start, that all stemmed from the work of um, hmm. the Children's Defense Fund. But what I didn't know was that the Alex Haley Farm was purchased at some point by the Children's Defense Fund as a place to train young people hmm. for freedom schools, freedom schools in communities around literature and reading. And so I get there and I'm at this roundtable. Now, get this, Russell. I had looked up the Children's Defense Fund. I had looked at their jobs available and I felt like I didn't qualify for any of those jobs. Hmm. And so someone that was on that trip knew I was a singer and she told the founder that I was a singer and the founder being Marion Wright Edelman. Hmm. So she told the founder that I was a singer. And so during one of our times together as a round table, Mrs. Edelman gets up and says, I hear we got a singer at the table. Will you share a song? <laughs> and so it's like, oh, my goodness. And I look over at my friend and go, you told her that. And so I get up and I share a song. And then at some point during the weekend, I walked up to her and I simply said, I'd love to come and work for you one day. And this was like a Saturday. On a Monday, I had a call from Mary Wright Edelman. She says, let's try and make this happen. And so, wow. and so I went to work for her for a couple of years in Washington, D.C. And then my time ended there and it had me going back into New York, but on the publishing side instead of the retail side. I mean, from Julie Andrews to Marion Wright Edelman, <laughs> you just find yourself talking to the right people. <laughs> yeah, I've got a knack for putting myself out there sometimes. Mm. Do you remember what you sang? I think I sang How Great Thou Art. Mm. Yeah. Mrs. Edelman, she loves the hymns. Mm. <laughs> Oftentimes, though it wasn't a part of my job, I'd have to show up and sing at a at a meeting. <laughs> Yo, that is so like black church, right? Like, you know, you just got to be ready if they know you can sing. Sometimes you won't know until that very moment. Oh. We'll have a selection by Sister Chrysanthia <laughs> Floyd. Like, oh, we are. <laughs> yeah. My my hometown pastor told me, always have a song in your pocket. And I was like, Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes mm. my pocket only got lint in it, but. <laughs> mm, mm. Well, I, I'm just, maybe there's still something in that pocket today. We'll see. We'll see. Oh, we'll Any see. case, so at this point, like, how are you thinking about this in terms of your faith? How is your faith helping you make sense of this journey? Oh, yeah. I mean, fortunately for me, I found a really great church in New York and a really good group of women as accountability partners. And I think that was the first time I really understood the meaning of a journey mm -hmm. and that things aren't as clear cut as we would want them to be in our life. And I think it's because when I looked at my sister and brother, my brother had a very defined path, you know, and that path was he worked as hard as he did. He got recruited to Georgetown. He then got drafted. And then he was in this career as an NBA player. And then my sister, always some form of law, and really stayed for almost 30 years at one place. Mm -hmm. And so the thought of me taking a turn here or a turn there I, did, I wasn't really comfortable with at the mm -hmm. time until my friend said, <laughs> This is, you know, this is not set in stone that you have to stay there. <laughs> wow. And that's when I truly started to understand how God creates a journey and makes a path for us. And I just really started to to lean into that for most of my decisions. As you know, I've, I've lived in many places at this point <laughs> and done many things, all still with books. But after I, I left the Children's Defense Fund, I went back to New York and then I was there for a couple of years, and I took a company transfer to a Christian publisher. So I left New York Publishing, and then my friends my friends in New York Publishing, some of them said, you're going to go work for the Christians? Seriously? You're leaving New York Publishing? And I go, yeah, can you imagine that? M me, Chrysanthia, a Christian 
is going to go work. <laughs> It's going to work for a Christian publisher. And so what was that journey like when you made that <laughs> pilgrimage? And where did that take you? Well, uh, where is Christian publishing? <laughs> yeah, right. So in 07, it brought me here to Grand Rapids to work mm-hmm. for Zondervan Publishing. But what I didn't know, May 2007, that I arrived that within probably six weeks that I was going to experience one of the uh, biggest losses in my life. I had lost. I had already lost my dad. I lost my dad in '95, so that had been, you know, about 12 years prior. But I think God moved me and allowed this door to open up to to come to the Christian side of Harper Collins because within six weeks my boyfriend was going to be dead. Wow. I mean, he tragically died at 36 years old, wow. and I mean, I don't know how I would have gotten through. Mm-hmm. that without the help of the folks, you know, that I was surrounded with at that point at mm-hmm. Zondervan. Was it as surprising as it just sounded like? Yeah, when, it was. When yeah, I woke up. I mean, mm-hmm. I was awakened by a call from his sister to say he had he had suffered wow. a stroke and he never he never awakened from that stroke. And so mm-hmm. I have to tell you, there was a lot of I spent a, a lot of time in grief years years in grief Mm. and anger and anger Mm. around that because at this point I'm, you know, I'm in my late thirties, you know, hoping to be married, even children. Mm. And I met what I thought was, you know, just an incredible godly man who also happened to be a classically trained musician and from North Carolina, but different part of North Carolina and different instrument, piano. We had so much in common. I thought, oh my goodness, this is just incredible. And so we had a very short time together, Mm. probably just eight months, just communicating and getting to know each other. And then another six months or so as what I would deem a couple. Yeah. I mean, that's still, that's over a year time spending with somebody that you are in, you know, you kind of know, with like, yo, I think this is going mm-hmm. to go oh, to yeah. this place. Yeah. So yeah. all of that is built into it. And when you mentioned anger, was some of that or most of that anger I got? Yeah, it was. I mentioned the women from my church in New York. I had one woman, her name is Soha, that when James died, uh, she called me and she said, hey, Chrissy, I want to every Sunday at seven o'clock, I want to just pray for you. I just want to call you and and pray for you. And I, I pretty much said no. And she called back and she goes, okay, how about I call you and you just answer the phone? You don't have to, you don't have to pray. You don't have to say anything. I just, you know, you don't have to participate. I just need you to pick up the phone. And I would say about the good first eight months to a year, I picked up the phone. I listened. So how would pray? And I would say, talk to you later. And I'd hang up. (laughs) And then somewhere probably in year two, I started to participate. So my heart started to soften a bit. But she was my prayer partner, probably for a good two and a half, three years. Every Sunday when we didn't have something else on our calendars, uh, every Sunday at 7 p.m. And she was relentless. <laughs> mm. Relentless. And so what happened that caused a softening? Because I'm imagining you're at a different place where you're still not angry at God about it now. Like, obviously, it sounds like a part of that was just listening to the prayers of a friend. But what else changed for you? Well, I think, you know, when I lost James, I was new to this community while people were supportive, I did not have that a close relationship with people as of yet. But over the years, I built that up. You know, I started to have really good girlfriends in this area. And so being around them changed, changed my attitude about things. You know, I had people walking alongside me that became very dear friends who at the beginning were were praying for me but they didn't know me, right? Mm. But into year two or three of this, they knew me. And so that changed. And I still, it's kind of a theme I I think about now is who knows me, right? Mm. And I think with Soha's prayers and just the building of community, 
that I was able to do in those few years changed my outlook. I was mm-hmm. also, I'd also thrown myself into an MBA program at Michigan State. Mm-hmm. So we were praying about my classes and just mm-hmm. surviving. And then also I got my own dog. And so Bolt became a bit of a therapy dog. And so it mm-hmm. turned my attention a little off of me mm. and on to just care of this this puppy that I needed to care for. Mm. And it's interesting, I just lost Bolt this past May and he was 15 years old. Wow. So I think it was uh, a, a multitude of things that finally softened my heart around that, around, mm. you know, being angry. I can't say that I, I think my anger wasn't as intense, but I think there was still anger, you know, yeah. but, but yeah. Or, or I would say, the question of why mm. for a person who felt like she'd done all the right things mm. as a person of faith, a person that grew up in the faith. And, you know, the one ask, you know, the, well, I've had many asks, right? We, we always say the one ask, just, just do this one thing. Uh, mm. But, <laughs> but the desire of a companion and, and children and things like that has, has yet to be fulfilled. And so mm. it felt like God was dangling like teasing Mm. me in Mm. a way with James. And that's the part I had to wrestle with. Like, why did he even bring me in my, into my life? He was going to, if he was going to take him away, I just couldn't, you Mm. know, I couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't comprehend that. And I think, I think the lesson from all of that was that for a girl who felt alone uh, in her childhood, Mm. That he wanted me to know that I could be loved by, Mm. say, the opposite sex. I was a late bloomer. (laughs) You know, I didn't Mm. date very often. That I could be loved. And and James was such a gentleman Mm. that it was a a great example of a godly man. And I think he wanted me to see that. Mm. Wow. Thank you for sharing that. And I think it's so real to talk about the reality of grief and loss. Mm. And even though there's still healing, the reality is that there's also still pain attached to any of those longings. But it's amazing to see how with perspective and hindsight, you could see the role and the particular contribution that the Lord allowed James to have in your life. Yeah. And even recently... I've been reminded of God's presence of um, knowing me, right? So part of it, mm. part of that relationship with with James was I've met someone who who's gotten to know me, who understands me. But, you know, as, as it's said in Psalm 139 about the all-knowing and all-present God, that he knows our thoughts and, and before we speak them, you know, we can't hide in darkness. He's going to find us. It's always light. Mm. You know, whether we go high or whether we go low, God is there and God knows us. And mm. I think that's been really a central theme for me. And I've been reminded about this psalm really over like over the last eight months, like it's come up, you know, like it's popped up in my head. But then I had a book proposal come through about a devotional for Psalm 139. And then our president one day, Dr. Lucas, in a meeting, pulls out Psalm 139. And I'm thinking, oh, my goodness. You know, so it Mm. it is a reminder, even while I'm still single and I'm by myself, that I'm not because God is he knows me. And I think the part of everyone's desire as far as intimacy is to be known, whatever that looks like. And for me, it's just a reminder that God's there. Mm. And how does the value of books and publishing and now as a publisher yourself, where you get to, you know, select and curate the process of what people will put in their hands. How does that process speak to this aspect of Psalm 139 for you? Yeah, I think I I think for us in what we do here is the desire to bring folks closer to the word of God and and the mm-hmm. word 
that we know is perfect, right? We know it's a perfect mm. word. Um, we understand that things are translations and things are contextualized, but we also understand that God's word is perfect and that, and so life's a journey and we're prayerful and we fully expect that if people are engaged in the word, that there's some transformative action that the Holy Spirit allows. And I think it's a huge responsibility to provide content to people that lead them further into the word of God. So when I think about Psalm 139, I think about folks understanding that God is always with them and that mm. that God is always present, that God is always knowing and that, to me, is a running theme through the Bible, that God is. No, that's heavy. And I think about the role of publishing that word and giving people words to be able to find themselves, right? Where Psalm 139, search me, O God. You know what I mean? You've known me, you know, in my innermost parts. And you know when I sit down and when I rise up and introducing people to that type of God who mm -hmm. sees them in their longing, just like he saw you at your hour of deepest need. That, I can imagine, is something that is very fulfilling. It's fulfilling. It's comforting. It gives me a sense of um, assurance. Hmm. The human me <laughs> will feel unsteady, but if I'm reminded that God's got me, it feels completely different. Hmm. And okay, so now as we talk about voices, right? So I see, I'm like, there's a couple tie-ins here. One, we've been talking about you literally finding your voice multiple times. Yeah. One as a singer, then later at Barnes and Nobles with this incredible gifting you have of selling books <laughs> and getting people excited about it. When you come to Our Daily Bread and you see that there's this Voices imprint and this Voices collection, what does that mean to you? And, and how does that relate to Psalm 139? Yeah. I think like some, there's always this revelation that there are there are books here for black <laughs> folks. <laughs> so there's a little bit of it's that. It's not just devotional. It's not right? just, you know, there's there's a little bit, little bit of that. But we've always said that it's important for our community to understand the steadfast faithfulness of God, no matter the circumstance, right? No matter the situation that someone might find themselves in, good, bad, or whatever, or indifferent, that it's important to understand that God is faithful through all of that. Mm -hmm. And I recall probably something that you said during the Juneteenth documentary was that God's faithfulness surpassed any suffering mm -hmm. that folks in slavery may have experienced. And that to me, I mean, it gives me chills to say that in the deepest, darkest part of our history, God is there. Mm. But it also is important to say in the deepest, darkest moments of your own search and struggle. Yes. When you were in that house and your mom was having an episode, yeah. God was there. God was when there. you were alone and, and hearing your dad, you know, passing or even James, God was there. Yeah. And that's the kind of God that we serve that Psalm 139, verse seven, how precious to me are your thoughts, O God, how vast are the sum of them. Yeah. I mean, it's amazing. Yeah, it, it's amazing. Mm. And the part that, you know, because I, you know, as a kid, I did not have the best self-esteem. Mm. And, you know, I I think about if you go down to 14, read 14. Now, everyone knows this verse, okay. but, but you know, it, it, it really does have special meaning. I praise um, you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. Yeah, and I do. Well, I don't know where else to end than, <laughs> you know, there's this song, Oh, Lord, my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the worlds thy hands have made. I see the stars. I hear the rolling thunder. Wasn't that the name of that book that you read as a child? I hear the rolling thunder. <laughs> I do. Roll a thunder. Hear my cry. <laughs> yes. Thy power throughout Ooh. the universe displayed. Then my soul sings, my Savior God to thee, how great thou art. How great thou art. Can you can you give us a little song? 
Oh my. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. <clears throat> Oh, Lord, my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the worlds thy hands have made, I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe displayed. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. This is where you're from. I'm Rasul Berry. And remember, it's not just about where you're at. It's also about where you're from. This show was produced by Ryan Clevenger and Mary Jo Clark. Also want to thank listeners Mary Legree Ford and Carl R. Anderson Jr. for their help in supporting and promoting where you're from. Thanks, y'all. Where You're From is part of the Voices Collection from Our Daily Bread Ministries.